Welcome to this offshore wind section here at Prado's 28th annual energy conference. My name is Bor Rosef and I'll share some of Pareto's high level thoughts on the wind market going forward. My presentation will cover three main things. First, we'll look a bit on what has happened. Then we'll try to make some predictions for the future before finally discussing the impact this will have on the various players in the industry. To set the scene, I'll start with a, a quick take on the renewable market in general. So this graph shows the cheapest source of electricity production around the globe. The green you can see here, which covers about 90% of global electricity market, renewables is the cheapest source of new bulk electricity production. This has been the case for a few years now, but it's vastly different to 2014 when the Paris Agreement was signed. At, at that point, Germany was a lone uh, a green dot on this map. What's new this year is the dark green areas. So this is where building new renewables capacity is cheaper than simply the running cost of coal and gas and covers almost 50% of global electricity markets. This includes key polluters such as China and now the vast majority of Europe explained by higher CO2 and prices and recovering commodity markets. So renewable production is inherently unpredictable and will require batteries against intermittency and other measures to secure energy security. Uh, with the extremely competitive cost of renewable production, however, this is a relatively solvable part of the mounting challenge we have to meet the goals of the climate, the Paris Agreement. Now looking at the offshore wind market, which is the most rapidly growing sub-segment within renewables. Based on the current project pipeline, we expect growth of about 20% over the next decade. So what's the rationale for offshore wind? Historically, it's been a few key things. First and foremost, few people like to see windmills from their uh, home. They make noise and for some reason, some think they're ugly. In addition, offshore you have good wind speeds and access to acreage uh, near densely populated areas uh, available. It's no coincidence that this industry uh, at its infancy is largest in areas such as the Netherlands, which is the most densely populated area across uh, in, in country in the world. The last point here uh, is one that has changed a lot over the past few years, and it is what I'll spend the majority of my presentation on. Offshore wind is no, not really uh, costly anymore. As a result of this, estimates have continued to be revised up. So we now believe we'll, be in 20, uh, we'll uh, reach uh, the levels we previously thought we would reach in, 2017, in, in 2040, uh, 10 years earlier. There's two main developments here. So it's one is increased ambitions in Europe and in China. And you have new, con new uh, countries uh, adding to the list as the industry has spread, spread out to be a truly global one. The underlying reason is the steep declining cost seen here in Europe with growth particularly revised higher following successful subsidy free tenders in Germany and Netherlands in 2018. This graph shows the development in all in costs, the so-called levelized cost of electricity over the past eight years. To make it as comparable as possible, I've looked at three Dutch developments. The first one is an Aneco owned wind farm sanctioned in 2012 and commissioned in 2015. Second is Ørsted's Borisella 1 and 2 wind farms, winning tenders in 2017 and coming on stream late last year. Lastly, it's Shell and Echo's HKN uh, KN wind farm awarded in the latest subsidy free tender. As this graph shows, costs have declined a staggering 75% or so within this short time frame. And here we've added a few interesting uh, comparatives showing just how this has completely altered fundamentals. In Europe, we now estimate that building the HKN wind farm will be cheaper than simply the running cost of coal and uh, gas plants, which are the marginal producers of electricity in Europe today. So Shell is not taking a bet on higher electricity prices here. This makes sense also in an oversupplied power market that we have uh, from time to time in Europe. It's worth noting that it's not completely comparing apples to apples here. So in the Netherlands, a grid is provided, which would have added around one euro cent per kilowatt hour. Conclusion would have been unchanged though. 
Uh, we also have used conservative figures on commodity prices. So we have not used current gas prices, which has resulted in electricity prices far above these levels at current, or assumed any increase in the CO2 price going forward, which is something we believe in. There's two things that have dri driven this, um, this uh, reduction in costs. The first and by far most important is the availability of large dedicated offshore turbines. So if you look on the first project on our list, that used a three megawatt onshore turbine. The latest used Siemens Gamesa's 11 megawatt dedicated offshore turbine. And this does two, two things. First, it lowers the balance of plant capex and opex, which is the main difference between an offshore and an onshore wind farm. This is largely incurred on a per turbine basis. So if you look on the Wessel spread, the number of offshore procedures, cabling, maintenance, and so forth, it's not determined by production capacity, but by the number of turbines and the size of the wind farm. So larger turbines and wind farms thereby means significantly lower capex and opex, and the cost composition looks more like it does onshore. The second thing that has happened is that while onshore wind turbines were made for onshore wind conditions, these new, new turbines are made for tough but resourceful wind conditions found offshore. So capacity factor for the first wind farm in our example is 35% on par with onshore, whereas offshore wind farms with modern turbines achieve production factors of 50% or more. The other key reason is lower cost of capital. So if you look on Holandskus Nord and most other later, uh, latest awards, we see an unlevered return requirement of around 5% which compares with 10% just a few years ago. There's two things that are driving this. One, you're benefiting from the general renewable trend. So renewables is generally capex heavy, uh, thereby benefiting significantly from the global yield compression. Spreads have also compressed as banks and equity markets alike are looking to add green to their portfolios. The second point and the one thing that's unique to the offshore wind industry is that it has developed from being considered a risky niche with a limited number of players a few years ago to a mainstream asset class where large infrastructure funds, most major utilities, and recent years also the large European oil majors are key capital providers. As we see it, cost of equity, if anything, is now lower offshore than onshore, with the risk, uh, with the risk uh, onshore uh, higher due to potential local opposition delaying processes. Now, looking at the Hollandskus uh, uh, Nord wind farm, uh, that uses an 11 megawatt turbine. Meanwhile, Vestas has already launched uh, a new 15 megawatt turbine available in, in the mid of this decade, which will likely be optimized to 20 megawatt when we look on the size of it. Siemens Gamesa has launched a slightly smaller one for now, but indicated that something bigger will be announced in the near future. So when we look at the end of this decade, we're most likely looking at turbines twice the size of those used at HKM. Combined with further supply chain efficiencies and closing of the price gap per megawatt for the turbine itself versus onshore, that could cut costs in half again by the end of the decade. And that's not discounted in current predictions, uh, which continue to overshoot forward costs in our view. Costs will continue to surprise on the downside. So with competitive and declining costs, uh, the scene is set for, for continued upward duration of market growth projections. In addition to the fact that it's no longer very costly for nations to set aggressive offshore wind uh, targets, we need faster renewable growth to meet our global emission uh, targets. Depending on the path, we need to accelerate wind and energy production by about two and a half to five times what's currently discounted in our projections. We also see continued and spreading local opposition against onshore wind. And we believe that the increasing competitiveness of offshore wind, which gives a viable alternative in most places, will likely increase that. Now looking at how this will play out for the offshore wind industry. The first thing that's clear to us is that the value of existing backlogs and development size has increased substantially. While significant uh, investments are required, even more capital is currently available. 
This has not only low return requirements, but also forced developers to take more risk to secure new development areas. This slide shows the price paid for the rights to explore development of, of offshore wind areas. Historically, these have been handed out for free. Exploration has costed money in the oil and gas industry, but it hasn't costed money in the offshore wind industry. That is changing. In 2018, the results of the licensing round in Massachusetts, US, was a shock to the market, raising nearly three times the value of the auction round in the US Gulf of Mexico for oil and gas leases. Compared to the total potential investment, though, it's still a matter of a few percentages. Last couple of years has seen a, a shift dwarfing this. So late last year, uh, at the time of our conference, BP agreed to purchase 50% of Equinor's offshore wind assets in the US for 1.1 billion. Acknowledging that Equinor have worked some of these projects in the meantime, this is equal to about 12 times the amount paid by Equinor to secure these areas a couple of years in advance. Moving on to the latest bar here, which uh, is, is a lot higher than all the rest. That shows the estimated price paid in the latest UK licensing round earlier this year, where winning bids again ended up beyond anything seen before. UK-based oil major and utility uh, BP and uh, utility and BV submitted the highest bids, whereby they will pay the government around £160,000 per megawatt per year for the right simply to develop a site of wells. With at least six to seven years until the project is ready to start construction, if successful in submitting winning bid in the government's price auction round, this will amount to $1.2 million per megawatt. That's equal to some 40% of the complete project value paid in site fees to the government prior to knowing essentials such as the development cost, the turbine used, and the price paid for the electricity produced. So with this in mind, it's quite clear that development rights secured for pennies a few years ago are incredibly valuable, and some of them will be super profitable. Our second conclusion is that the days where more or less all developers are successful are probably over. While return requirements have dropped, risk has increased uh, materially in new projects. So while developers have reaped most of the benefit from the strides of the industry so far, we expect the supply chain to see more of the financial benefit going forward. There are a lot of licensing rounds coming up, and one of them is the maiden site uh, licensing round here in Norway. With an additional layer of competition from a number of Norway-based companies, in addition to the usual suspects, uh, everything set for a very competitive auction. While nothing is set in stone, the indication for now is that uh, the site for bottom fixed wind farm in the southern North Sea will be subsidy free. Moreover, per now, transmission will likely have to be covered by the developer. While we see this as doable, we do note that this uh, will be the least favorable terms in Europe with a transmission scope of high importance given that the license area on offer is one of the most remote in Europe. So while project developers are required to bid more aggressively, we see an increasing risk of bottlenecks and inflation. Conversely, for parts of the supply chain, we expect steeply improved terms. Now this graph splits the positive revisions in market growth the next decade into the first and second half. As you can see, the entire upward revision has been made in the second half. This is explained by the fact that governments are setting aggressive targets for 2030, while lead times are long, so there is no room to revise 2025 estimates up. The growth will thereby not be gradual, but rather a, a step up in activity from 2025. One example of a bottleneck is for installation vessels. Recent years, these have been cheap to charter relative to their cost and available as and when needed for the developers. That's unlikely to be the case in the future. And many project owners are now already tendering to secure capacity as late as 2026. We believe bids are coming in at price levels far above those seen in recent years. We believe particularly the wind turbine manufacturers are well positioned uh, going uh, forward. As, uh, as mentioned before, uh, the turbine accounts for the majority of capex and servicing it the majority of opex. 
These guys are really the nav of the industry that have driven the development, while the developers have reaped mo most of the benefits so far. They are involved from day one, given the importance of turbine design uh, in, uh, to economics. And unlike the developer side of the table, the market is not getting fragmented and crowded. In practice, you have uh, three uh, potential suppliers. In addition, data is getting incrementally important. So Vestas and Siemens Gamesa have uh, a huge portfolio of spinning turbines measured every 10 seconds around the globe, both onshore and offshore. This enables them to build an unmatched data bank that they can utilize to provide the best services and develop the next generation turbine, optimized maintenance routines, and so forth. Again, unique insights, and they will be paid for that. And it also makes it very hard, if not impossible, for new entrants into this portion of the market. So that concludes my presentation. What has happened? Well, the offshore wind market has gone from being a risky niche to a mainstream asset class, and we have seen upward revision in uh, growth estimates. Looking forward, we expect that to continue. And we believe that uh, the supply chain will benefit more from the market improvement going forward, whereas it could be tougher times for the developers. Thank you.